Well, if we're not releasing the children today, go ahead and turn in your Bible to James chapter 4. James chapter 4. We are now in the ninth week of this series we've titled Together. You know, if you look at James and you read the epistle of James, you can tell very quickly he is about action. He is someone, the, the subtle theme of James, actually it's not very subtle, is if you are in Christ, prove it. Right? If you're in Christ, do something with that. Do something about it. And the way we're understanding it, the way we're reading it, if we, if we understand the historical context of James, that he's writing to Jewish Christians scattered around the Roman Empire, and they are forming these churches, these groups of believers, these pockets of those who call themselves a part of the way. That's what they called the, uh, the original church, you might say. Before they were Christians, they were just part of a sect called the way. The Apostle Paul talks about this in the book of Acts. As they were doing this, James writes to them and he says, listen, if you're a Christian, prove it, but prove it as you interact with one another. We saw this last week that he even refers to church members people who are a part of the church. And the way he uses that wording, he's not talking about the individual's members of their flesh. He's talking about the members, the individuals within the church. And so we read this, we understand this, that this is for how we are to prove our Christianity as we walk together in our faith. James is one of the first books, many people believe the very first book written in the New Testament era, preceding even the Gospel of Mark. So this is something early on written, and many of the issues he addresses, we can understand. We don't have to feel so bad when we have some of the same issues that he's addressing, because guess what? They've been going on since the beginning, right? And so we understand this, and, and last week we saw the, the issue of pride within the church, the individual pride of the members who are now fighting with one another, even to the point they're willing to kill each other. James says that that shouldn't happen. But this pride, it bleeds into what's being looked at today. I've titled this together, The Church Presuming, and I'm going to elaborate on that in just a second. But if you will, read with me, beginning in verse 13. Come now... You who say today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city and spend a year there and engage in business and make a profit, yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You are a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and also do this or that. But as it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Therefore, to one who knows to do the right thing and does not do it, to him it is sin. Father God, this morning as we traverse these waters, I pray that we do so successfully. Father, I pray that the words are not mine but yours, that it is a a thorough and complete exposition of your word, Father, that we hear it and that we heed it, that we take the application of the scripture to our lives as we leave and walk out better followers of Christ. Not because we want to say, look how good the message was or look how good we are, but look how great our God is. Father, for your glory, we ask these things. Amen. If you understand this text and you understand what preceded it, the idea of pride, the idea of arrogance, the idea of I want my way, I want my thing, I want to do what I want to do. And we often, when we do these things, what we are really doing is presuming God's place in our lives. We are trying to say, I want my way, not his way. I want my will, not thy will. I kind of touched on that a little last week. Church, we must never presume God's place. That's the overall theme, the one point I hope you walk out with this morning, that we must never presume God's place. Now, I want to say this right out of the gate. This passage is not condemning making plans. It is not condemning uh, 
having a business or trying to travel for your work or making money even. It's, it's not that. Or it's not even condemning the idea that maybe one day I want to dream about being here, making profits, making money, and, and being able to relax. It, it's not condemning that. It is cautioning us against making certain plans without concern for God's place in our lives. Because too often we presume his place. Now, presume is an interesting word in English. It actually has two meanings. The first is to suppose it is the case based on probability. Well, the second definition is what we're kind of rolling with this morning. To be audacious enough to do something, usually something that should not be done. When we presume something, we are trying to take the place of something or usurp what should what is already there. To have the audacity to to take God's place in our lives. I've often used this quote, I've referenced it many times, but it was C.S. Lewis who probably said it best. There are two types of people in this world. There are those who say to God, Thy will be done, and the others, the other type. Those who God looks at and says, okay, have it your way. But the Christian, if we are to be faithful followers of Christ, our job, our place, our position should be God's goals, God's will, God's wants first and foremost. To do anything otherwise is to presume his place because God does not play second fiddle. He does not share the spotlight with anyone. And James has been talking at length now at this point about many things, enduring trials, taming the tongue, the pride of the heart. And Today he's inspired by the Holy Spirit. He is going to be wrapping up many of those thoughts. James is drawing his epistle to a close. And if you look ahead, that makes sense. We've got about a chapter left, right? So he's doing that. But the point of his text today is that we must never presume God's place Or even try to plan in his place. Plan God's will is what we try to do often. Instead, we should pray God's will and we should pursue God's will in our lives. But we must never presume to take his place. The first thing we often do, the error we make, is we like to plan God's will for him many times, don't we? He even says this in the text. He begins with these two words, come now. Come now. This was actually not a very formal way of speaking. This was what's called a colloquialism. It's kind of a a, a common way of speaking. And James is the only one in the New Testament who uses this wording. In, In all of the New Testament, he's the only one bold enough to say this. Now, if we were to translate it to modern English, you might say it says, now look here. It's very firm. It's very much a stop Pay attention to this. That's what he's, that's what he's getting at here. And in, in actually, in a very real sense, James is all but attacking his audience when he writes these next few verses. He aims to get their attention. He wants them to pick up what he is putting down. He wants them to stop what they're doing and pay very close attention. It's almost reminiscent of Isaiah, Isaiah 118, that reads, Come now and let us reason together, says Yahweh. Though your sins are as scarlet, they will be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they will be like wool. But that is a passage of hope. Isaiah wants them to stop and pay attention there. James is bringing correction. He says, now you stop and hear this. Come now, you who say... You see, he's zeroing in. He's getting them in, their, in the crosshairs, you might say. He's talking to very specific people within these churches. Now, everyone needs to hear it, yes, but especially those whom it applies to. You know, not every sermon preached is really going to hit you hard as it may hit others. Not every sermon or passage in the Bible may have something in it that directly applies to your life in that moment, in that day. But it hopefully will keep you, if you understand it, keep you from having to be the person who needs to hear it. That you heed it and apply it before you fall into any traps. When Paul tells Timothy, reprove, rebuke, and exhort, every sermon should do those things. 
But not every sermon is going to convict you every day, every Sunday. Not every sermon is going to rebuke you every Sunday. And not every sermon will always encourage or urge every single person. But there are those to whom it should apply. And we should all hear it, lest we become the one who needs to hear it. Like I said, those who say, James is targeting, those specifically who say, today or tomorrow we will go. This person presumes that there is going to be a time for them to be free to leave town and go somewhere else. Again, it's not saying this is wrong, but it's the attitude in which the person says these things. Proverbs warns us, do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what a day may bring forth. And yet this person says, well, we're going to go to such and such place. Now, I should be very clear, James is using a very generic way of speaking here. There is no specific town called such and such. All right, it's like Timbuktu, right? We all understand this. Anyone ever tries to tell you, James is referring, there's a deeper meaning here. They were wanting to go to such and such city and such and such was really this town. No, no, that's not what he's doing. It's very vague for James. But for those listening, for those reading this and understanding it, it's something that could be specific to them in that moment. Were were James writing just to us today, he would say, come now, listen up. Listen up, you guys in Lisbon. Okay, pay attention. For those of you who specifically say, well, on Tuesday, we're going to go to Fargo. Or on on Thursday, we're going to go down to Aberdeen. Right? Those are places specific to us. This way, it applies to everybody. Those of you who make these general plans, these travel plans, and again, there's nothing wrong with making travel plans. There's certainly nothing wrong with the next thing James says. He says, spend a year there and engage in business and make a profit. On the surface, everything seems on the up and up, doesn't it? There's nothing really wrong with any of that. Not really. But notice something before we move on to verse 14. They are traveling. They are spending a whole year in a different city. They're engaging in business and making this profit. The time spent, well, that's a temporary thing. Their own business is being conducted first and foremost. That is that they're being selfish in how they're doing this. And they're intending to make a profit. They're all about the material gain. That's why James is rebuking them. Because on the surface, it may not seem like anything's really wrong. In fact, some of you probably have to travel for work. Maybe you have to go to Bismarck for a few days to sell cattle or, or go to Watford City to train somebody in a different office or whatever the case may be. That sometimes happens. There's nothing necessarily wrong with that. God is not opposed to people traveling. He's definitely not opposed to people planning and being good stewards of their time. The psalmist rightly says, teach us to number our days. But what he says is that we may present to you a heart of wisdom. The difference, you see, between the psalmist and James, at least James' audience, is that the psalmist wants to present something to God. The person who is, James is referring to is someone who wants to go and make something for themselves. So we have to ask, we have to pause for a moment here and say, ah, so whose glory am I really about when I make my plans? Whose glory do I want in my business dealings? Whose glory do I want in my work? Because so often we want all of the credit and none of the blame, right? Well, James calls us out for that mentality. That's exactly what he's, he's doing here. In fact, his wording is so deliberate and so precise, I would suggest to you that James is actually writing to these Jewish believers And alluding to something they would be very familiar with in the Old Testament, in the law specifically. A very subtle theme here. You see, they say, today or tomorrow we will go. And it sounds eerily similar to, come, let us build for ourselves a city and a tower whose top will reach unto heaven. And let us make for ourselves a name. Why did they do that in Babel, if you're familiar with the story? Well, because they wanted to make a name for themselves. They wanted glory for themselves. Babel was actually founded by a man named Nimrod. What's the Bible tell us about this guy, other than he has a silly name? He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. But if you understand that text, he's not a hunter of animals. 
He's not a slaughterer of bears, tigers, and lions, oh my. He is a hunter of men. He's a murderer. And before the Lord is not as though he's doing this for God's glory. He is competing with God's glory. He is before the Lord as in no other gods should be before me. That's the way Nimrod was establishing himself. And so he founded Babel in this area called Shinar because he wanted people to think he was something great. He was not a righteous man. He was quite the opposite. The Bible tells us he was a mighty man on the earth. And, and Babel was a commemoration of sorts of his own greatness. And so that city goes on. What do they do? They want to compete with God. Let us make for ourselves a name. And James says, today or tomorrow, let us go to such and such city and make for ourselves some money. Well, I don't want glory, God. I just want to be wealthy, right? Still eerily similar. I bring this up, just this is a small point here, uh, kind of a little rabbit trail, so forgive me, but I think it's interesting, this phrasing, this phrasing, engage in business, you, we wouldn't pick this up, a Jewish reader would pick this up. Engage in business in the Greek is only one word, it's emporosometha, and it's a compound word, it's where we get the word emporium, and it's related to emporos in the Greek, which could be translated as merchant or trader. James uses this specific word to point to a negative Jewish stereotype that we as Jews are all about the bottom line. They're all about the money. We've all heard that stereotype. Stereotypes are stereotypes because there's an underlying habit in a culture for such things. But James says, no, 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 no. You see, in Christ, that stereotype ought not apply to us. We are not like that. We are a new creation, and we are not about that bottom line. As Jewish Christians, we are Christians. First and foremost, we are in Christ. And so he goes on, he says, you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You see, we make these plans and we, we have these grand schemes, but it's a lot like planning a road trip in March in North Dakota. <laughs> right? Oh my goodness. Can I rant for just a second? When I was in Bible college down in Ellendale, I'm from Southern Illinois. This time of year, things get warm. And at the very worst, you're going to have some rain. And I assumed America is all the same. And I would get so depressed and so frustrated because I would be the guy who'd say, today or tomorrow, we're going to go to Aberdeen and we're going to watch a movie. And if a new Marvel movie came out or a new Lord of the Rings, I would, oh man, good luck keeping me in Ellendale. God did. It's called snow. <laughs> Wednesdays, be a beautiful day. Thursday, Nice and warm. Weather report looks good. Friday, nine inches of snow. Jeff, stay in your dorm. Right? James is saying life is like that. You do not know what tomorrow will be like. You are not the North Dakota weatherman. And they don't know either. <laughs> Jesus tells a parable similarly of a rich farmer who tears down his barns and builds larger farms. Oh, sorry, barns. I said farms. Barns, larger barns. And he stores all of his grain and all of his goods in there. And he, his idea is, well, now that I'm older, I can relax. I can eat, drink, and be merry and enjoy my retirement. But God said to him, Luke 12, 20, but God said to him, you fool, this very night your soul is required of you. Now who will own what you prepared? Jesus concludes that parable by saying, so is the one who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. This is what James is reminding his audience of. Now, maybe they hadn't heard this parable yet. You know, James is writing before that was written down. But he's telling them, you are a vapor. You're a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes. That word vapor means it's the Greek word atmos, and it means it's smoke. It's a cloud of gas. Think of that what you will. A light wind would blow it away. It's like your warm breath on a cold day. You see it for a few seconds, and then what? It disappears. It's gone. You see, that's all our lives really are 
In that brief moment, James is saying it is foolish. It is the peak of foolishness to be but a breath and think that you can rule your own life rather than live your life in submission to the one who gave you life. Back in chapter 1, James touches on this. He says, the rich man is to boast in his humiliation because like flowering grass, he will pass away. And now James has zeroed in on that rich man and he's telling him why this should not be. You know, to contrast that, God is eternal. Our lives are but a half a blink to some some being like that. But yet in our hubris, in our pride, we aim to take his place of authority of our own little kingdoms, of our own little creations, our own little businesses, and we try to rule in God's place. Last week, we saw that in our pride, we try to even run his church. As Christians, we do this. As Christians. Those who claim to be in submission to God would try to rule over God himself? That's nonsense. We're just a vapor. You know, God even says that he alone is the one who knows the future. He alone is the one who knows what's really going to come next. And I think every spring and fall here, he proves that, right? But he says in Isaiah, Isaiah 46, remember the former things long past, for I am God, there is no other. I am God, and there is no one like me declaring the end from the beginning. And from ancient times, things which have not been done, saying, my counsel will be established and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. But you see, we want our pleasure. We want what we want, our wants, our kingdom come, our will be done. But in doing that, we are making God's plans for him. We're planning out things and calling it his will. Church, we must never presume God's place. Instead, we should be praying God's will. Now, this can be one of two things. We can pray God's will for him, supposing what his will is, and saying, God, we can use the Bible like a spell book, or like I compared it to an Ouija board last month, but uh, last week. But the thing is, we can also try to use this like a crowbar to try and pry God into our direction by twisting his scripture. We think we're twisting his arm to get him to do what we want him to do. Church, that's... That's not going to work, just to let you know. But that's also a manipulation. We should not do that. I I, I think sometimes we pray the Bible, we say, God, your word says this. And God says, but you know that's not what I meant. You're just trying to get what you want. You don't really take my word into account and want what I want. We do this far often more than we realize, I think. James begins to point that out. And how we think and how we do and what we should do and what we should think is pray that God's will be done and then let it happen, not try to manipulate him. He says, instead, you ought to say. Instead is a change of direction, in a sense. And you ought is the direction he's now taking us. In retrospect, if you look back at verse 13, come now, look here, it's like a stop sign. You better stop. Listen, verse 14 is a speed limit sign. You don't know it, but your life is super fast. It's a vapor. You should slow down, seek God's will, stop trying to be the the lawgiver of your own life. And then verse 15 is a detour saying, nope, you better go this way. The bridge is out. Detour here, avoid disaster. But how many of us, myself included, we think the rules of the road sometimes, they're beneath us, right? We really know how fast we can go and get away with it. This is a problem. We want to make our own path. We want to make our own detours. We plan God's will for him. We we would be better off praying God's will be done in us, be willing vessels of that. So in this moment, we would be not too inaccurate to think of James as that state trooper whose red and blues you see in the rearview mirror. He's pulling us over and he's going to try and tell us what we're doing is not okay. We need to be on the right path. Now, how do you respond to the state trooper? Do you say, hey, buddy, my salary pays your salary? My taxes give you a job? Please, just for the record, as someone who's worked with law enforcement, don't say that. That's a really good way to get tased. All right? 
or, or, or start the process of being pepper sprayed, don't do that, all right? No, if you, if you say to an officer, I have found that <laughs> the many times I've been pulled over, that you can say, yes, sir, officer, I'm going to listen to what you have to say and follow your advice. And for a few months, I usually do, Right? And if you talk that way to a police officer, guess what? You're less likely to get a ticket. You're less likely also to have an accident. You ought to say, you ought to go down this path. If the Lord wills. If the Lord wills. There's something someone else once said, as he told his disciples how to pray, he said, your kingdom come, your will come be done. Of course, it was Jesus. Our life should be about his will. Our prayers should be about his will. Because otherwise, if we don't, we are going to try and make our will his will. We saw this last week. This is what pride does to us. It tells us it's okay. We want what we want, not what's best for the church, not what's best for us together, but we live for the God of me, James is carrying that theme even further. He says, you're trying to usurp God's place, God's position, God's power. Start praying his will, his wants, and start submitting to those things. Start following after him, not expecting him to come following after you. James says, if the Lord wills, we will live and also do this or that. If the Lord wills. One of the most often overlooked words. We don't think too highly of it. We don't think too much of it. It's only two letters. If. If. You see, when we're the God of our own lives, if is not a possibility, we've already determined it. We've already decided what we want. And if God has a way of stepping in and stopping us, if becomes, well, it becomes a frustration. If leads to, to bitterness, it leads to rebellion. Because we've not submitted to the if the Lord wills, we just expect all along that God must have willed it because he allowed us to do it. Therefore, God must have wanted it too. I've said this before and I'll say this again, and please understand this. Please hear me out before you start throwing things at me. But God does not care about your comfort. God does not care about your money. God does not care about your health or your pleasures or your fun nearly as much as he cares about your eternity. God does care about those things. Don't get me wrong. Don't misunderstand me. God does care about all those things, but they pale in comparison to what he really cares about, and that is whether or not you have submitted your life to him, submitted your will to him, and whether or not you're heading in the right direction when your life ends. If the Lord wills. The meaning of life, or the chief end of man, as the Westminster Confession says it, is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Paul tells even slaves in Rome, he says, obey your masters, not just when you're being watched, not just to get special gain or attention, or to please men, but to do so as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. From this we can understand the the instruction that he's giving to the slaves is simply the, the lowliest person on the totem pole of life should be about doing the will of God with sincerity. When Jesus was at the lowest moment of his life, facing the cross, he prayed, my father, if this cannot pass away unless I drink it, Your will be done. You know, in that moment, Jesus didn't care about his comfort. He didn't care about his health. He didn't care about his money. What he cared about was God's will being done. When Jesus, at his lowest moment, prays this, and the slave, who is the lowest of humanity, prays this, we should understand that we too should seek, first and foremost, God's will. What is it that makes the Christian assume that we have a power greater or a will that is something that should supersede his 
What else but our own pride? Our own selfish ambition, as James says. There are those in Christianity who, hoping to scratch itching ears, will often say or even preach that that we are little gods. That when you're in a right relationship with God, we are equal to him. That we're on par with him. But church, that is the oldest lie in the book. The serpent said to Eve, you will be like God. Only now it's gotten worse. The farther we get from the garden, it does. Now we want to be God himself. Church, the Christian has to understand the truth. And so James continues and he he scolds them. He says in verse 16, but as it is, you boast in your arrogance. I said this last week, one of probably the biggest problem in the church today is that we forget who God is. And then we forget who we are. Isaiah tells us all our righteous works, all the good things we've done are like filthy rags. He says, for all of us have become like one who's unclean and all our righteous deeds are like filthy garments. And all of us, whether like a leaf, uh, wither like a leaf and our iniquities like the wind carry us away. But Christ, no matter who we were, no matter how great we were, no matter how, how rich we were, before Christ, we were, we were beggars. We were nothing. And like the parable Jesus tells us in Matthew 22, the, the king is holding a wedding feast for his son. Those who were invited were unwilling to attend. Those who got the initial invitation didn't want to go. And so for them, there awaits destruction. He says, then he said to his slaves, the wedding is ready, but those who were called were not worthy. Go therefore to the main highways, and as many as you find there, call to the wedding feast. Now follow me on this. Those slaves went out into the streets and gathered together all they found, both evil and good, and the wedding hall was filled with dinner guests. That's us. Whether we were good or evil, there was somebody who came along and shared the gospel with us and invited us to the wedding feast of the Son. And we were, if you're in Christ, you were invited and you accepted the invitation. Jesus told Nicodemus, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. That's the invitation. That's the gospel. Do you believe? Do you repent and believe in Christ as your Savior? That's the invitation of the wedding feast. But catch this, every person in that parable, they were invited off the street They didn't run home and change their own garments. The king had to have provided the wedding clothes for them when they got there. In the same way, our filthy garments were replaced by the king of kings. Now just follow me on this thought for a second longer. If we don't repent, and in our arrogance, we want to wear our own clothes, we want to do our own thing, We want our plans to supersede his, our will to be trumping his. When the king came in to look over the dinner guests, he saw a man there who was not dressed in wedding clothes, and he said to him, friend, how did you come in here without wedding clothes? And the man was speechless. You see, when we try to invite ourselves into the feast, when we try to take over the feast, run the feast, It's because we think we know better than the king. We think we deserve something. I don't need to wear the king's clothes he gave me. I have my own, thank you very much. My clothes are just fine. My way is just better. We think we can be good enough, and then we boast about it. We speak arrogantly, and we try to push our will, our wants above all else. And when the king said, then the king said to his servants, bind him hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called and few are chosen. James says, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Arrogance in the Greek is alizoneus, and it means we are self-exalting, self-absorbed conceited, believing all achievements are done by our own merit. In other words, we're still wanting to wear our own clothes to the wedding. We're still wanting our way. We're still wanting our will. And we shouldn't do that. We should be praying to the king of kings, what is your will? Boasting 
In the Greek, it's caucasus, and it, it's a public proclamation of our self-satisfied contentment in our own achievements. When we are glorifying ourselves, when we are wanting our ways, we are not glorifying God, and we are not following his way. The Christian understands all glory is to him because all glory is due him. So what James is telling us is that if we're focused on ourselves, we make our plans without God in mind, we make them, we begin to take God's place, making our plans his plans, and when in truth, we should be praying that his will be done instead. Church, that's presuming God's place, and we shouldn't do that. Finally, we should be pursuing God's will. Verse 17, Therefore, to one who knows to do the right thing and does not do it, to him it is sin. He is wrapping up everything he has said from verse 1 of chapter 1 until right now. He says, therefore, he's concluding. He's bringing it to a close. He's not just wrapping up today's message. He's not just wrapping up chapter 4. Remember, the chapters didn't exist till like the 1500s. He's wrapping up everything he said from the beginning. So it's, it's similar to how the Apostle Paul in Romans 12 says, therefore. And he's wrapping up everything he said from chapters 1 through 11. This is what James is doing here. Therefore, when it's all said and done, to the one who knows to do the right thing and does not do it, to him it is sin. In other words, to the one who's read this, to the one who's understood this, to the church who studied it and heard it preached week in and week out. One commentator said, to attain spiritual maturity, a believer must do the good he now knows. He must stand confidently on God's word, even in trials and temptations. He must compassionately serve his brethren without prejudicial favoritism, but with practical faith. He must speak carefully with a controlled tongue and wise cultivated thought. He must submit in contrition to his all-powerful father, lawgiver and, ju lawgiver and judge, with a humble spirit, just action, and a trusting heart. He must be what God wants him to be, do what God wants him to do, speak what, as God wants him to speak and sense what God wants him to sense. To do otherwise is a sin. It's rebellion. To know what is right and refuse to do it is called a sin of omission. It's not only what we do that matters, it's what we choose not to do that matters as well. The good we fail to do is equally as important as the evil we do and how it condemns us. This is what separates the sheep from the goats. In Matthew 25, 37, Jesus said, The righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? Because the righteous know what is good, and they do it. They don't understand necessarily who it's for. They just know it's what we're supposed to do. Jesus says, if, if you did all these things because I love these people, you, it's the same as if you did it to me. Whom the king loves, we do that for them. But the contrast is, he'll say to those on his left, I was hungry, you didn't give me anything to eat. I was thirsty, you didn't give me anything to drink. I was a stranger, you didn't invite me in. I was naked, you didn't clothe me. I was sick and in prison and you didn't come to visit me. Then they themselves will answer, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? Their sins were sins of omission. We knew we should be doing this, God, but we didn't see you, so we just figured we'll just not do it. That's the attitude in which they've done this. If, we, if we'd known it was you, maybe we would have done it then. And Jesus said, then he'll answer them, say, saying, truly I say to you, to the extent that you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. You understand, when we are pursuing God's will, we are pursuing that which God wills. And he wills that we are hospitable, loving, caring, serving, helping, and so on. One pastor said it this way, he said, sins of omission lead directly to sins of commission. Jesus said very clearly, whoever does the will of my father, he's my brother and sister and mother. You understand, we cannot do the word of God if we do not know the will of God. 
And we cannot know the will of God if we don't seek to understand the word of God. I recently saw something on social media. It's kind of making the rounds again. I, I think I've mentioned this before the last time it did. But it's something that should really terrify every church. Every church in America. It says, if the Apostle Paul knew about the United States of America, we'd be getting a letter. Shouldn't laugh at that. Because we did get a letter. We got all the letters God intended for us to get. And we just don't care. In fact, we have the letters printed more in our language than any nation, any generation ever before us. And look at our country. Look at the news. Look at what's going on. We wouldn't be getting a letter. We got them. We have them in the KJV, NKJV, ESV, NASB, NASB 95, NASB 77, CSB, NLT, NET, MSG, LSB, NIV, RSV, NRSV, TLB, AMP, RGT, ASV, just to name a few. There's even one named after Darby, and he's only been going here for six months. <laughs> Church, there's something wrong with this picture. Every year, there's a new English translation of the Bible, and every year, our nation, the English-speaking world, falls farther and farther into sin and rebellion. Some will say, well, that's because it's not being preached right in many churches. No, I would submit to you it's not being read in many homes. Because of this, like in the time of Judges, we have become a generation that did not know the law of God. Now, the sick irony of this all that I, I want to get to is it is a great judgment upon a nation when there is a famine of the word of God. How greater judgment will there be for the nation who has the word of God in that many translations alone and refuses to heed what it says? We are becoming like the nation of Israel in the time of the judges. We've got the law. Nobody's not reading the law or not preaching the law to us necessarily. It's there. We're just not teaching it to our children. We're just not bringing it into the home. We're just not wanting to heed it. And so we're becoming a nation that does what is right in our own eyes. That is putting ourselves in God's place. That is making ourselves our own judges. We must never presume to do that to ourselves. I'm going to ask the worship team to come back for just a moment. I know I'm very hard on certain false teachers, and I talk about their theology, but I want to talk to you for a second about what really matters that comes with that theology, and that is the abuse when I was 17, I was starting my fall semester of high school, and I had spent about a year being very angry at God. Pastor Jeff, why do you say their names? Why do you do this? Because I've, I've seen the abuse, and I've been a victim of it. When I was 17, my grandpa passed away. My grandpa was my closest friend I've ever had, and that includes my, my friend Jason Fisher. Some of you have met Jason. He's a sweet guy, great guy. But my grandpa and I were so close. And he got cancer. And he was given just a few months to live. And he lived actually much longer than that. About, I think about six years longer than that. And for a long time while he had cancer, we were told constantly God was going to heal him. This man, when I was my son's age, could pick me up and throw me in the air. I didn't look like I do now. But he was strong. He's the strongest man I've ever met. And the most brilliant man I ever met. I mean, he could read. If people think I read a lot. He put me to shame. He had a mind that just, very deep thinker. But the cancer spread to his brain, and he would just sit there winding string that didn't exist. He would talk about stuff that never happened. Things, people in the room that weren't there, and sometimes it just wouldn't make any sense. The man who so effortlessly would toss me in the air 
I was now having to drive into town to help lift him up off the toilet. And we were constantly being told, but God's going to bring a miracle. In fact, at one point, someone said we should go to St. Louis because there was a Benny Hinn revival. And Benny was the man of God who had the power to heal. Knowing what I know now, how big of a lie that truly was, I'm glad we never wasted the gas. But it shows that even the brilliance of my grandpa, even in that moment, he said, God is the same God here as he is in St. Louis. And if God wants to heal me, he'll heal me. And if God wants me to die, I'm ready to go. Now, he'd say that, but the caveat was under his breath, but I don't want to go on the next bus. He was the only man I ever met who could be dying and laugh about it. But I became bitter because I was hurt by the promises people made on behalf of God. This is what the word of faith teaching does to people. They presume that because we have faith, we have the power. They presume that because we can speak things, we are on par with God. That is a lie from Satan. And that is why I'm so passionate about that sort of thing. Because I've seen more people besides myself, their faith, their life in Christ, reduced to shambles because they, people wrote checks with God's name on them that was never intended to be cashed. Church, this cannot be us. Understand what God has said and live in that truth. Be about that truth. No one should ever be hurt like that from the word of God that was never his spoken. We're doing the preaching class, and one of the things they'll hear me say many times, if you're going to stand in the pulpit and say, this is the word of God, you better make sure it's God's word. Too many people say, thus saith the Lord, and God says, uh-uh, I never said that. Learn what God has actually said, follow it, live it, and trust in him as he's revealed himself in scripture. You know, if I could go back in time and talk to myself back then, I'd just say a handful of words. Learn the meaning of sovereignty. Learn who God is. And it'll save you a lot of frustration. Our plans are folly. Our life is a mist. But God's word never fails. He said, my word will be which goes forth from my mouth. It will not return to me empty without accomplishing what pleases me and without succeeding in the matter for which I sent it. Church, if you're here today or maybe you're watching online and, and, and you're bitter and you're, you're hurting because of what somebody said to you in God's name or, or somewhere they spoke on his behalf, and you took it as true and you never tested it and you never, never looked further into it. That wasn't God. That was not God. That was abuse. And I'm so sorry you went through that. That was somebody presuming his position. But there is grace for you. And there is mercy for you in the cross of Christ this morning. And if you're here and you've, you've been in your own life, taking God's place, it's time to give up that throne and let him have that seat. And we're gonna take communion and I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you to stand. We're gonna worship together. But as we do, Paul tells us to judge ourselves rightly. I would ask you to pray about this. Where in my life am I presuming God's place? And then repent of it. Confess that sin to him. And when we're done, I'll dismiss us in prayer. But come forward in your own time, in your own place, take the, take the bread and the juice and take communion on your own with your loved ones. That's what I would challenge you to do. But spend some time in prayer first. Will you stand as we close in worship this morning?